Welcome to the Stressless Eating Podcast, where we help diet-obsessed and food-crazed women break themselves out of the food and body prison, end the dieting madness, and take control of their health for good. I'm your host, Leanne Ellington, and this podcast is about answering one question. How can you heal your relationship with food and your body and take a practical approach to this whole self-love journey, but without all that restriction, obsession, and shame, and without needing years of therapy to do so? If you want to know the answer, you're in the right place. All this information is 100% free, so please subscribe to and review our podcast. Hello and welcome to today's episode. I'm actually really excited because not only do I, I have just a really special guest here today. You've heard me talk about him actually on the What's God Got to Do With It episode and I'll attach that in the show notes. But one of my best friends, Kevin, who has also just been one of the biggest forces of transformation in my entire life. Um, We've known each other for close to 10 years now and now I get to have my brother from another mother here living in Nashville with me with his beautiful wife, Jennifer, who will also be on the podcast at some point in time, but today we are going to, and I'm going to let him introduce himself in just a minute, but we are going to talk about some really powerful distinctions. And so, um, you know, Kevin has this unique ability to really just see people and see their bigger future and invite them into a possibility that they couldn't imagine for themselves. That's what he's been doing for me these past 10 years. I mean, he knew me when I was in the fitness industry and we can, we can even talk about some of the things that he called me out on back in the day. But, um, he really has this ability to see people's future bigger than they can see themselves, invite them into it and help them bridge that gap. Um, he has worked with some of the the biggest, you know, personal develop experts in in the world, including people like Tony Robbins, and um, he's been he's he's met with Richard Branson, and I mean, he has been he he knows so many people, but he's not just a guy that knows a bunch of people. Every single person that has been in his life could tell you like he has impacted my life, even just what, with one conversation. Um, And most recently, within the past few years, he really took his knowledge and he distilled it and really laser focused it towards transformation within women, which obviously, you know, I'm biased and I am so purposeful and passionate about talking about this women's brain and mindset conversation. But Specifically, he helps women who are really looking to make a breakthrough in this area of femininity. And it's not the kind of femininity that you might typically be thinking about, hearing about. I know he absolutely and radically changed my definition of what that looks like. And we're going to talk a lot about that. So without further ado, welcome to the Stressless Eating Podcast, Kevin. Well, thank you for having me, Leanne. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for that very kind introduction. Absolutely. Well, before we dive in, would you, I'd love for you to just kind of take them on a little bit of a, a journey, a spiel about your life, what, you know, who you are, what you've been up to, and what you are really committed to in this world. Yeah, it's it's always sort of tough when you have to uh, uh, describe yourself. But, you know, at a high level, I was, uh, you know, typical American family, middle class, born and raised in Washington, D.C., you know, went off to college, was going to live the American dream. And uh, actually, I have lived the American dream to a, to a degree. But, you know, I uh, was living in Arlington, Virginia, doing business with large organizations like the White House and the CIA and the home- Homeland Security and all these big agencies. And, you know, one day I found myself in my penthouse condominium. I was launching businesses. I was selling software. I was advising, uh, all these things. And I found myself somewhat bored, you know, and almost depressed to yeah. a degree. And, uh, you know, I said, man, if I had, if nothing was in the way and I could, uh, you know, have anything in my life, what five things would I do? And so I said, well, I'm li- now imagine I'm living in the concrete jungle of Washington, D.C., Arlington, Virginia. And I said, well, I'd surf every day, looked out my window, no waves in the Potomac. <laughs> <laughs> I'd learn to speak Spanish. You know, I'd get closer to my faith. I would go do foreign mission work, and I wanted to immigrate to a foreign country because I saw the immigrant story, people that came to America with nothing, created anything, right, with nothing in the way. And so I thought to myself, well, what's the one thing that I could do all five things? And I said, well, Costa Rica. 
So at that time, I said, what if I just got rid of everything I owned and moved to Costa Rica? And I started playing a game with myself. I said, I want to play the game that this time next year, I don't recognize who I am. You know, we can talk about this in a bit, but really it was like, what's that caterpillar to butterfly experience? Like, who do I have to become? What do I have to do to be this kind of guy that lives on my own terms, that lives the life of my dreams, et cetera, et cetera. So I proceeded to kind of get rid of everything I owned, get, you know, end my career, and I moved to Costa Rica. You know, I surfed every day. I hablo español, perfecto. I speak perfect Spanish now. <laughs> I did the foreign mission work. I got closer to my faith, and I became an immigrant. You know, there you are in a foreign country that, you know, you don't know the laws, you don't know the language, you don't know the people, and there you are. And I think, uh, you know, doing these big things, you know, it's like I tell people, buy the ticket, the rest will work itself out. You know, I'm a big advocate of buying the one-way tickets. Yeah, you told me to do that several times, and I have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I'll encourage people on, on the, you know, on the, on the podcast to, to do that. Like, what's that big thing that's sort of haunting you that you haven't done yet? Like, book the ticket. And let the rest work itself out. But that's sort of the essence of transformation, you know, being willing to let go of who you are, who you've been, to allow a clearing to show up for something that you didn't even know was possible. So I think those are some of the things we'll talk about today. Um, but yeah, I've spent so much time with the different organizations like the Tony Robbins Life Book, uh, you know, Hoffman Process, uh, the folks at Landmark Forum and spent some time with Werner Earhart, you know. So, you know, putting myself around, that's one of the things I did too. I wanted to put myself around the best in the world, people who I admired. And you mentioned Richard Branson and, you know, there's so many more people who I just got to have dinner with or spend time with or study with or whatever it may be. And that had a massive impact on my life. And one of the things you realize when you hang out with, you know, billionaires, uh, so to speak, is, you know, they're no different than us. Yeah. And sometimes they're not any brighter or anything else. So, you know, uh, I've lived a pretty interesting and uh, great life. I've had an interesting career as both as an employee, as an entrepreneur, you know, as a servant. I started an organization called Surf and Serve, where we go down and build homes and feed families. Uh, I lead a trip of executives and entrepreneurs down, and we uh, after we do the service work, we go surfing and volcano hiking, all these things. So one of the things I wanted to do, I had a vision for my life back then. I wanted to go from surfer dude to CEO. Mm -hmm. That was sort of the bigger future I saw for myself. And now, as you know, I spend a lot of time in Nicaragua and you know Sri Lanka and these places. I'll be surfing, and the next day I'll be in some executive business meeting or advising some company uh, in the cybersecurity market, yeah. so to speak. You know, so... Uh, you know, and then what I've done most recently is taken sort of this transformational knowledge and work. And I've had the fortune to speak at events uh, all over the country, you know, specifically to women, yeah. you know, and some of the distinctions that I discovered, uh, some of it is from being raised in Western culture in the United States of America, uh, seeing things change, you know, the dynamic between men and women, uh, the dynamic, uh, you know, just how the, how the world has become. And then traveling the world, seeing these ancient cultures that still sort of practice the way it's always been for them. And so, you know, I've been able to create some distinctions and have some massive breakthroughs. As you know, you know, I've gotten women married. I've gotten women out of bad marriages. I've gotten women the ability to, you know, uh, break free of the prisons, as you would say, yeah. of, uh, of culture and create whatever life they wanted. And that's, I think, some of the stuff we'll talk about today. I'm excited because, okay, so I want to kind of rewind back about 10 years ago when we first met, and you can speak to this, but, you know, this idea of femininity that we're going to talk about, how it's not what it seems, you know, I was very deeply indoctrinated into a, a pre predominantly male industry. I was in the fitness industry, and I met Kevin at a fitness marketing uh, event, and one of the first things he came up to me and did is just like, I was standing there with my arms crossed and he just like uncrossed my arms and invited me. I remember he invited me to, it, w would you want to tell the story about the airplane and the fork? What was that? Oh. <laughs> Where I was eating a salad and you literally just like wanted to. Like oh yeah. Like a little kid. Oh yeah. So that's great. So I, you know, I was eating, we were at lunch somewhere yeah. in Costa Mesa, California. Yeah. And, uh. And I was, yeah, I was eating. I said, hey, you want a bite? And I was like, and you just open your mouth. and. <laughs> but it was bite. so out of my comfort zone because I was yeah. just so in, like, the way I would describe it is I was kind of like a dude. I was a very feminine dude, but I was just hanging around with all of these guys 
where their, you know, measuring stick was like how many amazing cars they had and how big of a mansion they could have and throwing out terms like six figure income and seven figure income. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it was just not mine. And it wasn't who I wanted to be. Um, and I literally was hanging out with a group of guys in, in my like business world that were calling me dude. <laughs> they were yeah. calling me their, like they were calling me their sister, but I was essentially like their brother. And I didn't even realize how much I had, and it was way before I met Kevin, it was a lot of my own body image struggles where I had so, I disconnected from my feminine, beautiful, elegant, confident self, or maybe she was never created because of culture. So we're going to talk about that. You well, and, to that? yeah, and the point of that was a pattern interrupt. You know, one of the ways that we have breakthroughs is to have a pattern interrupt. And, you know, instead of being serious all the time, yeah. let's be playful. Yeah. Let's be, let's be carefree. Let's go back to a time when we're three years old and our parents are like airplaning food into our yes. mouth or whatever it may be. And so I was just introducing you because, you know, I could clearly see that you had been indoctrin- indoctrinated into this culture of guys. Yeah. And that's why I uncrossed your arms. Yeah. You know, I was like, just sit here and be carefree. Be yeah. cool. You're safe with me. Yeah. You're safe with us. And we'll talk about the idea of being safe totally. and the importance of being safe to access femininity. But that was really just a pattern interrupt to create some breakthrough right then and there in that moment. And that's always where breakthrough happens in the moment. So that was being playful and allowing you to be carefree and reminding you of who you truly are. Absolutely. And I had an awareness like just now as you were saying that, like I didn't even realize how uncomfortable I was around food. So the fact that you were inviting me to be carefree with food, that was like a double whammy of pattern interrupt for me. So anyways, we we could go on and on, but we're going to go ahead and dive into the good stuff. So today we're going to just, well, Kevin's going to really just walk us through five just powerful distinctions. And the thing about distinctions is you've heard me talk about this idea of an awareness awareness. So what we want to do is like give you an awareness of things that you didn't even know you could have an awareness of. And the cool thing about awareness is not only is it the first step in creating a massive shift in your life, but once you see these things, you're not going to be able to unsee them. Like you're going to just have a new consciousness, a new level of consciousness in your brain. So with Without further ado, what is your first distinction that you wanted to share today? Yeah, that's great. And, you know, the the idea of the awareness is the blind spot, right? So we're going to give access to the blind spot. And like you said, once you see it, you can't unsee it, right? And so the first first point today is femininity as the most powerful force in the universe. And when I say that, I truly mean it, you know, and, and to... To go back to what you just said, you were in this all male dominated world. You've been in this world where you you were taught that masculinity is the strongest force. And you know, my my argument is that's not true. Right? Femininity is the most powerful force in the universe. In fact, men will die for it. We will fight for it and die for it, but only when it shows up as feminine, not as masculinity. And so that's the uh, the very first point here is how do you access this idea of femininity in a culture where it hasn't been lifted up? Yes, women have been lifted up, but mostly to be in a masculine world. Mm-hmm. Be like the guys. Be like the men. You can play the same sports. You can be in the same military. You can do the same jobs. You can be, you know, you can get the same things that guys can have. Well, what if you don't want the same things? What if you want something entirely different? And what if you are built in a way, made in a way, designed in a way that makes you want to be different? Yeah. You know, so there's this idea of, uh, you know, being the same and being, uh, instead of being opposite, when we are created with absolutely opposite ways of seeing the world, opposite body parts, Mm -hmm. opposite hormones, opposite brains, right? Yeah. Yeah, and don't hear what he's not saying, ladies. This is not, you know, this is, we. there's a lot of talk nowadays about feminism and all that, and we're not going down that rabbit hole. This is not that, right? This is about really just connecting to the essence of who you are biologically and neurologically and psychologically as a female. We've talked about this before. There's, you know, 99% of the female and male brain are about the same, um, but that 1% difference is a massive difference. And if you've ever felt like, why? 
do I feel the way that I feel? Why do I feel so, you know, over emotional or hypersensitive or I feel like men don't get me or whatever it is, it, you might want to just pay attention because you might actually be working against the nature of your brain. And so for me, I, you know, a lot of our discussions, Kevin, were I was like, I got to show the world how smart I am and how successful I am and how much money I can make. It was this like over independence almost as like a form of hustling for my worthiness. And what happened is I was totally turning away from f- wanting to feel beautiful and confident and feminine because I thought that that was like superficial or, you know, cocky or whatever I was calling it at the time. And I was so disconnected. Can you speak to that? Well, yeah. And also I really will make an important distinction here is that I don't know what femininity looks like, mm-hmm. but I know it when I see it. Yes. Right. And it doesn't show up looking a certain way or acting a certain way. You know, it's like you can go from, in, you know, both sides of the spectrum, right? And it's, but it's, it's really femininity has a uniqueness yeah. and it's designed uniquely within you. One of the, um, one of the analogies I use in my program is uh, telescope versus kaleidoscope, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, men are like telescopes, right? You pick up a telescope, you see through it, it's clear, it's directional, that's where I'm going, right? Well, you, you know, women have been taught to be telescopes and you pick up the same device, you look through it, it's a kaleidoscope. And it's confusing, but it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's captivating. It's unpredictable. The slightest move of it changes it forever. Yeah. It's entirely unique, but you can't take your, your eyes off it, right? right. And the, the distinction I make is that the telescope without color is boring. Yeah. It's not a life worth living. The kaleidoscope without direction can be lost, right? Yeah, so absolutely. we've been made perfectly and oppositely to mm-hmm. come together to be this this one. Yeah, and then really turning your back away from that and making it wrong, like, embracing the colors of your kaleidoscope versus thinking there's something wrong with you because you're experiencing all these layers of you, that's a big distinction in itself. And all those colors of the kaleidoscope and those shapes and those sparkles, they all represent the different personalities. You know, you are the CEO and you're also the beautiful pageant queen. Mm -hmm. You're also, (laughs) literally, you're also the, uh, you know, the BFF. You're the little sister. You know, you're the mama bear. You're the angry gal. You're you're all of these things, yeah. right? It's literally a kaleidoscope of personalities and archetypes that you have within you. Absolutely. And just so the women out there know, guys don't have that. Yeah. Like we don't. And it's why like we're not as complex. We're not as powerful. You know, this this whole thing about femininity being the most powerful force in the universe is because you have access to all these different types of personalities. Yeah. Guys don't. Yes. You know, and, and I won't talk about it here. I talk about my program, but yeah. the 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 telescope is very simple. Yeah. It's simplistic. You know, one of the things I talk about in my program is guys are kind of dopey. <laughs> We're just not that complex, right? Yeah. So the, the the telescope has has two different personalities, and we maybe talk about those some other time. Right. But but really, it's like understanding the power of femininity, Absolutely. like and not dismissing it and trying to be masculine. Yeah. You have masculinity, but don't live there. Yeah. Live within the power and beauty and of the kaleidoscope. Absolutely. And not being ashamed of wanting to feel beautiful and pretty and elegant. And we're going to talk about that. Yeah, so totally. awesome. I love it. What is your second distinction? Great. So the second distinction is there's no such thing as independence. Mm. It's a myth. Say more. Right? Yeah. So <laughs> tell us everything. Yeah. There's this idea in our culture of, you know, especially in the United States, uh, but it's really this idea of being a rough, rugged individual. And if you look throughout the history of the world, that's just not true. It's never been that way. We've always been in communities, in cultures, in tribes. It's how we're made, mm-hmm. right? The community is everything. And so we've been taught all through school, I'd say incorrectly. Uh, to be independent. Now, hear me. I'm saying it is good to be autonomous. Right. Right? Autonomy is great. You have to have your own unique personality. You have your own unique vision of the world, your own unique goals and path to go after, your own unique purpose. Autonomy is different than independence. Independence doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the analogy I use is, you know, go to Starbucks and get a cup of coffee. How many people did it take for you to get that cup of coffee? Right. You know, There's somebody to even just write your name on your cup. Thousands. <laughs> yeah. The person who you know Grew planted the beans, the, beans yes. the person who picked the beans, the person who drove the, that truck to somewhere else, the person who made the bag for the beans, you know, the person who drove the truck that got it to where it went to, the person who roasted it, the person who made the coffee in the store, the person who wrote, like you said, wrote the, the person who made the cup. Yeah. It took thousands of people to get you that cup of coffee. Go live on a desert island by yourself. Yeah. The ultimate independence. If that's the goal, go do it. 
You won't live. You can't survive. It's impossible. You know, so really, the truth is, independence is a myth. It's a lie. If you if you bought into it, you know, good luck. It doesn't work. Dependence mm. is the highest form of consciousness. Independence is the lowest. You know, Stephen Covey in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, calls he, he calls it interdependence, yeah. which might be a more powerful word word if you love it, but really think about it. You're dependent. Yeah. Last night I flew on an airplane. Yeah. Did I fly the plane? Did I fuel the plane? No, I was completely dependent on the airline, on the pilot, mm-hmm. on the you know, flight attendants. <laughs> I was de- completely dependent. Yeah. You know, I just closed my eyes and somehow I woke up an hour later and I was in Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah. So, you know, if you look at your life, you know, you drive down the road, you are dependent on the person driving the other way not to crash into you. Like, yeah. we are all dependent on everything. Take, oh, go try to be independent, doesn't work. So. Absolutely. You can use the word interdependent, but the more powerful word is dependent. And you realize all the people you're depending on in your life. And it's not just the people that, you know, in your family or the people at your job. I'm saying it's everyone. Every night you go to eat out out to eat at a restaurant, you're depending on the chef to make you good food that's healthy, that's not poisoned, you know, like so when we realize the amount of 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 surrender and and what we do to depend on everyone in our culture. It becomes very, very powerful. Yeah. And I would even go as far as say, and I didn't know this because when you met me, I was misindependent, right? But it can be even dangerous to believe in that because what I notice a lot with the women I work with and speak to is this identity that asking for help and receiving help is this weakness and that there we end up being really poor receivers and we don't know that it actually isn't a weakness, it's actually a strength. And to just own it as, because here's the other thing, like we as humans, we are wired to need connection and need community and help and connection. I think I said it twice, it's that important, you yeah. know? But so we take on this identity, when, when we take on an identity of independence, Independence, it actually breeds identities of not being able to receive, not being able to connect, not be able to have deep levels of intimacy. Yeah. And I would say even just the idea of being needed. Yeah. Right. We are all created differently. We all have unique skill sets. But, you know, here's a challenge for you. Go out in the world, find someone in your life. Like, I really need you. Like, you're really important to me. Mm-hmm. I depend on you. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's yeah. the ultimate beautiful thing. It's it, Think about your... Uh, you know, you're, you have a pet, and a dog or a child or whatever, like they're completely dependent on you. And like, just like we're dependent on our neighbors and everyone else in our society and our culture to be able to survive and thrive. And so I think the myth of independence is really uh, destroying access to femininity mm-hmm. to, for a lot of women, yeah. you know, and it's also destroying men as well. So, you know, I think it's important that we realize how dependent we are on each other. And if you want to use a word like interdependent, that's okay too. But I think dependence, yeah. you know, it's like, because we've created words like codependence and this, yeah. and I'm like, yeah, you know what that is? That's just a distortion or a perversion of true dependence. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I depend yeah. on you. I really yeah. do. You and know? not being ashamed of it. Your clients depend on you. My clients depend on me, yeah. right? People out there that are listening to this, there's people who depend on yeah. you. It calls forth your personal responsibility to not just the person in front of you, but culture as a whole. Mm-hmm. So I think if you're chasing independence, I'd say stop or, you know, good luck. It's like you climb that mountain and you're up there all alone. Like, yeah. that's no fun. Yeah, even just try on this idea of what if dependence and being dependent was the strength, was the solution. What if you just try that on, ladies and gents? Awesome. What is your third distinction? Okay, this one is a, uh, it might be controversial, but I don't think it's too controversial. I think they've all been controversial. Are, are they? Yeah, amazing. I know. Because we're helping people see what they're not seeing. And all of this, ladies, is is just an invitation to try it on. You yeah, know? exactly. And so, and, and also anything that's transformational always yeah. will challenge status yeah. quo. I right? mean, for, for the record, I can't even tell you how many times, because Kevin is like pretty much my, want, my first person on my speed dial when I need support, advice, help 
help when I've literally been like, I need you, friend. Um, and he'll say something and I'll be like, screw you, dude. Like, I don't want to hear that. Yeah. No. <laughs> you know? And it pisses me off. It challenges me. And, I mean, we've had conversations where I've just been like, hey, I'm just not ready for this right now. And then, like, maybe, like, I'll get off the phone and call him back and be like, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know? And it's just because ch- – but the, and, I mean, I'm sure that this the flip has been switched on in our situation as well, you know? But – that's what true friends do is is challenge and and really you know get under what's what needs to be uncovered but yeah if this if any of this what we're sharing is challenging you good that's a great thing it's opening your eyes to something you might not be seeing and that's what i said kevin is the best in the world at helping people see a greater future a bigger possibility and then just simply inviting them into it so now yeah. what is well, your third distinction well i'll get to that in a second but you know it's really all progress starts with the truth you know yes. the distinction is there's the commitment to the truth so mm-hmm. you know that it, winston churchill said this one of my favorite quotes is the truth is incontrovertible Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. There it is. And it's really important, a di- important distinction is not being right, yeah. but speaking the truth. Absolutely. Right? And the truth is what sets us free. So the next little gem mm-hmm. is the idea of feeling pretty. Oh, this is my favorite one. <laughs> the importance of feeling pretty. So powerful. And we're going to stick with that word pretty, but you can use whatever word you want, beautiful or whatever, but... Here's the distinction uh, I want to get. And, you know, I've been in the beauty business uh, a, a few times, and it, that's where I got the distinction. I said, wow, there's a difference between masculinity and femininity, men and women. You know, women, uh, what's, what's, let me ask you this question. What's the yeah. one thing we all do before we leave the house? We look in the mirror. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So at some point before we leave our house, we look in the mirror. Men look in the mirror differently than women. Mm-hmm. Women look in the mirror and they say, I want to be pretty. Mm-hmm. That's the goal. So what do you, you tell me, what do you do in the morning before you leave, before you go somewhere? Yeah, I mean, and it's funny because I could, t- I could speak to this before I had this distinction and now, now, but before it was um, almost, yeah, it, it was looking to be pretty and now it's looking to be pretty. But it, the distinction before was that I didn't, I thought that it was like a bad thing. Like I was almost ashamed that I was looking for it because I thought it was superficial. Yeah. And it's not, it's natural. Yeah. You know, women spend so much money on cosmetics, on makeup, on tanning products, on all kinds of things, hair, you know, it's like the reason, uh, you know, you get up, you shower, you know, you put on makeup is because you want to be pretty. And let me ask you, Leanne, and I want everyone out there to consider this. You know, what happens to your entire day when you feel ugly? Yeah. Tell me. Yeah. And and again, I love how you said feel ugly, which mm-hmm. is another distinction. It's not about looking ugly. It's about it. That's and right. that's a subjective, objective thing. Right. But when you feel like crap, right, when you feel like you don't you don't feel attractive to yourself. And this is not even, and that's a separate conversation, how others perceive you, but what you, how you feel about yourself, it is this ripple effect on everything you do, think, say, every action you take, every behavior, whether you know it or not, how you feel when you eat your lunch is going to be different based on how you feel when you look in the mirror, how you feel when you're on the phone with somebody that can't even see you energetically is going to shift. That's right. It is a massive impact. Yeah. And so really it's great. The distinction again, I I don't know what pretty looks like, Mm -hmm. but I know it when I see it, you know, it's same thing with femininity. I'll just kind of use my granny Rose as an example. Mm -hmm. My granny Rose, 87 years old, paralyzed on the left side of her body from a stroke, uh, was one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. You know, she doesn't, she's not sexy or she's not, she, but she was so beautiful and so feminine. And I remember she had a hard time speaking because her paralysis uh, affected her tongue and her language. And I, you know, she would kind of speak like this, you know, that was all she could say. And then one time I just looked at her, I said, granny, you are so pretty. And she looked at me. She goes, I've been pretty all my life. Yes, great. <laughs> like Rose. that tongue just yeah. started working. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so precious. It and I would, her nervous system. It affected her nervous yes. system. And she was like, oh, my gosh, I could just see her light up. This man, this big, strong man, even yes. her grandson telling her how pretty she was. And she would just hold my hand. And she really was so beautiful. Her eyes, like I even got the kaleidoscope analogy, looking in my granny's eyes, yes. just so beautiful and so feminine. And she came from a different generation. But again, it goes back to that feeling. Yeah. I feel beautiful. And anyone out there, I challenge you, you know, have someone tell you or tell yourself, yeah, I'm pretty. Mm. And then say, I'm ugly. 
Like, just feel the reaction you have, yeah. right? And it's really important. And this is part of femininity. When guys look in the mirror, we, first of all, half the time we don't look in the mirror, right? We just go out. We don't care, right? We throw a hat on, whatever it may be. And it's just a different distinction. Yeah. It's not one's not better than the other. One's not bad. One's not good. It's just how we're designed. Women have a deep desire to be pretty. It goes back to the beginning of time. Yes. You know, women are like beautiful flowers, mm-hmm. right? And it's like, and if, if the women out there knew mm-hmm. how powerful you are in your beauty, yeah. right? Guys just have this thing, like we're not, again, we're not that bright, we're not that, you know, we're a little bit dopey, but when we see a beautiful woman, a pretty girl smile at us, mm-hmm. we melt. Yes. And so that's another part of, you know, what you were mentioning, like when you're on the phone, just feeling pretty, yeah. smiling is the greatest gift that men can be given, mm. right? And so that's also part of it. Just a smile makes you pretty. Yes. It doesn't matter about anything else. Really, really get clear here. I'm not talking about overdone sexuality or overdone makeup or some of the lip injections or any. I'm not talking about conforming to society at all. Yeah. I'm talking about unleashing mm. your confident pretty like that you just feel pretty yes. and it's really confidence that's the yeah. that's a, that's the that, that's the more mature word yeah. pretty is like the little girl word yes. and sometimes it's important to speak in these terms just to sort of bring back remember the the, the food yeah. airplaning into your mouth you to unleash to unleash yeah. the carefree inner princess it's another word i like to use because we've sort of been bombarded with like boss babe and mm. you know executive, hustle hustle this, and you know, I'm going to be whatever. If we just kind of reel it back and we look at our blind spot, it's like, oh my gosh, I just want to be a pretty princess, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. A couple of big distinctions here. And I talked about this on the beauty pageant episode, um, but this idea that beauty is not a seeing ladies, it is a being. And I can't even tell you how many women I've talked to that they get to their ideal weight and they still don't feel it because it's a feeling. It's not a seeing, it's a being. It lives in your self image. It lives in your identity. But the other big distinction here is This idea that most women, not most women, all women at the end of the day, they want to feel pretty and beautiful and feminine. But most women, when you ask them what they think they want, they say, I want to be skinny. I want to be fit. And again, I'm not making that wrong, but you're not going to necessarily get one without the other feeling. I've been like the smallest I've ever been and had flat abs and toned tushy or whatever you want to call it and felt so unbeautiful and ugly, right? And I've been bigger and thicker in my thighs and felt beautiful, right? And even at that pageant, I was probably somewhere in between those body shapes. And it's a feeling, ladies. It is not a, it is a being, it's a feeling, it's not a seeing. And it doesn't necessarily come when you lose weight. Yeah, and just a couple things on a personal note is, my wife, Jennifer, uh, you know, she smiles mm. and her, just the littlest smile from her, I don't care what she's doing, what she's wearing. I mean, it just lights up my heart. Yeah. So just like that. And where does that come from? When you smile, you're saying I'm safe, I'm carefree, yeah. I'm confident, I feel pretty, right? It's like versus the frowny face and the anger, like, you know, there's it, walking around that way. It's like, you're going to repel. And it, like the smile is the most attractive thing that's out there. And one other thing on, on a personal note is that my brother married this beautiful woman named Melba. And Melba had the most beautiful giggle. Mm. And I noticed it. Like I remember when I first met her, I don't know if they were engaged yet or maybe they just got engaged. And she would constantly giggle, like smile and giggle. And I was, and she's like, you know, late thirties, you know? Yeah. And I said, wow. I said, that is infectious. And the night they got married, I gave the speech because I was the best man. And I said, Danny, your only role the rest of your life is to protect that giggle. Yes. To protect that smile. As soon as she stops giggling and stops smiling, you got work to do, right? It means she doesn't feel safe, okay? Totally. Which we'll get to that in a minute. Oh my gosh, yes. Such good stuff. And just ladies, again, if there's anything that I personally want you to take away from this distinction, it's that you are allowed, and in fact, I invite you 
to take ownership of this idea that, yeah, you're allowed to want and desire to feel pretty. It is not superficial. It is not silly. It is not vain, right? It is just part of the essence of who you are as a woman. And the more or the faster you actually embrace it rather than fight it or ignore it and think that like making a certain amount of money or finding a certain partner or losing a certain amount of weight or whatever it is is going to make you feel the thing that you inherently can feel today without losing a single pound that the faster I believe you are going to come home to the essence of who you are, which is what we all really want to just be home in who we are, that confidence, that self love, the essence of who we are unapologetically. It's great. Okay, so the next uh, the next distinction is feeling safe, mm. right? the uh, The number one desire for women is to feel safe, mm-hmm. right? So when you feel safe, when you feel confident, when you feel like you are, so it's when I say this, I mean physically safe is first, mm-hmm. right? So we are always concerned about our physical safety, especially women. You know, and the distinction I make is versus men. You know, I was at a, a Tony Robbins conference one time and he asked an audience of, I don't know, several thousand, maybe five to 10,000 people. And he said, okay, um, how many women in the last six months have feared for their life? And about 80 to 90% of the women raised their hands. Mm-hmm. And I said, whoa. And they asked the same question to the men. How many men here have feared for the life in the last six months? Maybe three guys. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was like blown away and it gave me that distinction instantly. I'm like, oh my gosh. Women walk through the world afraid, physically afraid. You know, think about it when you, you know, you go to TJ Maxx. I know you're a big TJ Maxx shopper. <laughs> you know, I love <laughs> TJ Maxx and Marshalls. <laughs> or wherever you go, the yeah. Kroger or whatever. And it's nighttime and you walk out to your car, you're kind of looking over your shoulder, right? Like you live in constant fear and it's just the way we're designed. I don't. Mm-hmm. I tell people I get off a plane in Tanzania and I'm, I feel safe. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, anywhere I'll walk through the, you know, the worst parts of, any city at night because I feel safe. Now, I wouldn't do that on purpose all the time. It's not the right thing to do. But my point is I'm never afraid, never, ever afraid. And it's a very important distinction because uh, and the distinction I make is first is physical safety, yeah. right? You want to feel safe. Second is emotional, mm-hmm. right? Like the, that you want to feel emotionally safe, safe to be able to express yourself, right? And then the third I think was safe is spiritually safe, yeah. right? You know, safe to be able to express your spirituality. And I think that's a really critical part. And, yeah. you know, and I'm really speaking from the standpoint of, of life in general, but really in a relationship, Yeah. you know? It's like, you know, I, I, when I work with women or I coach women, it's often about, okay, do you feel safe with him? Mm-hmm. Are you safe? You know, are you safe to A, be who you are? Yeah. Like, as your natural self-expression, you're living out here as your most feminine, your most carefree, your most beautiful self, Mm -hmm. right? And then, do you feel emotionally safe? Are you safe to just be fully self-expressed? Your love, your anger, whatever it may be. Like, this is is where the kaleidoscope comes back in. Mm -hmm. You know, the the, the challenge of the kaleidoscope is it's completely unpredictable. You know, you woke up this morning and you didn't know how today was going to show up for you. You know, you've called me on days, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm a mess. You've called me days, you're like, I'm the best in the world, right? (laughs) So it's like this emotional roller coaster. Guys have it too. It's just different than the women. So to be able to feel safe in any relationship, but specifically an intimate relationship with someone you love, Mm -hmm. the man's responsibility is to create that safe space for you. When I talk to men about this subject, I say this. Women are kaleidoscopes and they instantly, their jaws drop. They're like, oh my gosh, you're right. It's unpredictable. They're beautiful. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's ever changing. And, and I said, your job is to sit there and admire mm. the kaleidoscope. Mm. Yeah. Let the kaleidoscope be exactly what it is. Let femininity be as it is. Mm. That's your responsibility. Create a safe space. For the kaleidoscope and the femininity in the woman, the beautiful woman, however she shows up to show up exactly how she is. And if you just think about that for a minute, in a work environment, you know, in a a love environment, in a friendship environment, when you're out at night, wherever you may be, the safer you feel, Mm -hmm. the better you are. Absolutely. It it unleashes everything, right? 
Yeah, and just to kind of stack on that, I can't even tell you how many women I talk to that they are in relationships where their husbands or partners or whatever think they are amazing and beautiful and lovable, and they are the one rejecting themselves. Like, they don't feel emotionally safe in their own skin and in their own brain and mind, and they are are self-rejecting and self-abandoning. And um, so a couple of things that are kind of interestingly controversial based on your distinctions that you set before about this, you know, a lot of women might be hearing this and thinking, I'm an independent woman. I don't need a man to make me safe, right? So that's another interesting kind of like contrast to the to the typical thought. But part of it, ladies, is I also want to invite you into it is your job to meet yourself where you are and the safety might actually be there for you. You might have a man that is doing all he can do to make you feel emotionally safe. But if your self-image and your identity is constantly rejecting yourself and abandoning yourself and isolating yourself and calling yourself fat or just criticizing yourself, you might be missing what is there for you. That safety that again, it's not a desire by your brain. Your female brain requires emotional safety. It's non-negotiable to your brain. And if you're feeling out of sorts and out of control, it's because again, you're working against the nature of the neurology of your female brain. Yeah. And it goes back to confidence. You know, you can replace that word safety with confidence, you know, and everything becomes a piece of confidence. And again, some of the distinctions I'm saying, just take a look, you know, I don't know, maybe they're, maybe they don't work for you. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But, uh, but take a good, solid look. What's happened in our culture in the last, you know, 50 years or so is that we've created a safe culture. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to move to Costa Rica, cause I was like, man, there's no like cowboy spirit. There's no pioneering spirit in America anymore. All the roads are paved. You know, everything's safe. There's police everywhere. I was like, gosh, I want to go where it's dangerous, right? And like, women are like, take me somewhere where it's paved and safe. And <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you can actually survive easily. You know, it's kind of like, remember that, uh, there was an article years ago with like Bill Gates and uh, Steve Jobs. It was like Revenge of the Nerds. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like before it was the person who could build and do all this stuff. Now it's like the person with the, the smarts can yeah. get by. Like, you know, women in my life are attorneys. They're doctors. I mean, they're very successful women. My mother was the supervisor of, of, of technology curriculum for a big school system in Virginia. You know, women have the possibility to do whatever they want to create their own safety, right? And so sort of the safety here is like, what is the community you're building? Who are you feeling safe around? Yeah. You know, in true safety and intimacy, yeah. right? How are you creating that intimacy in your life? Absolutely, which again, kind of intersects with that difference between independence and interdependence versus autonomy. Yeah, you it's know? great. Yeah. And I think it's important, and this kind of leads into the next next distinction, yeah, right? It's, uh, you know, women are visionaries. Mm. And I think it's really important for uh, women now is, where can you find female mentors in your life that are operating from their most feminine self, mm. right? Like where they're operating in life at, as femininity as their natural self-expression. And here's the thing that I think we've lost a little bit in our culture is that, you know, if you're feminine, you're not going to be successful. So you go back to that, oh, I got to be, a, I got to be like the guys in order to be successful. You got to hustle, got to prove myself, got to be the top of the, the heap or whatever it may be. And the fact is some of the most successful women I've ever met have embraced their femininity and they kind of like walk, not even walk, it's like glide through life and their career because there's something special about it where people will like open doors or people want to associate, right? And so I think, you know, looking at even someone like a Mary Kay, you know, Mary Kay was in a male dominated world and she felt back then in the 30s or 40s, whenever she came about, uh, you know, that she was blocked and she said, okay, well, I'm going to go out and start my own business. And what did she, what was her business? Makeup, beauty. Helping women be pretty. Yes. You know, she yes. just embraced this and said, that, you know what? We're going to go so feminine. Listen, we're going to give you a pink car when you're the top mm-hmm. rep, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. So I think really embracing that and being a visionary and being a pioneer in femininity, right? Not femininity as it's been created the last 20, 30 years in this world of, you know, fear mongering, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's like terrorism or war or a constant like, breaking news. It's like, oh my gosh, because all that does is sort of harden our spirit. Mm -hmm. It's sort of surrendering into that little princess, Mm -hmm. you know, imagining for a moment, if you want to look at a, uh, you know, certain movies out there like uh, Aladdin, Mm -hmm. you know, the princess who goes on the magic carpet ride and when she surrenders into her femininity, what happens? 
a whole new world, yes. right? And so, like, what is that whole new world that you're creating? And listen, go out in your life, look for、uh, visionaries. My Granny Rose was a visionary. She was so feminine. And I'm going to tell you something. I watched Granny Rose shoot snakes in the, you know, in the <laughs>、yeah. mountains of North Carolina. You know, she taught us how to gut fish. You know, she, you know,、uh, I tell the story. My grandfather, who was a World War II hero, came back, scooped up my Granny Rose. They eloped and got married. And you know, at 30 years old, my grandfather, they had three kids,、uh, had a、uh, his heart rate went down to under 30 beats per minute, and he was almost dying. Right, and so you know, my Granny Rose had to step up. And my grandfather was one of the first in the country to have an automated pacemaker, and so he was out for like two years. So Granny had to put on her big boy pants, so to speak.、Mm-hmm. She had to become sort of the leader of the family. The, the family. She had to become the masculine provider, and so she did for two years. She got a, a job with the Florida State Police. She made arts and crafts, and she had to provide、yeah. because women have that ability. They have that mama bear. They have that executive. They have all those things. Where my grandfather was just laid out. After two years, my grandfather made his comeback, and then Granny Rose went straight back into this feminine leader of the household. You know, the motherly figure, the loving. But she had it within her.、Absolutely. You know. So I think finding these mentors in your life. Who in your life is most feminine? Right. I mean, feminine that you admire. Right. That you just look at. You're like, oh my gosh, that's so sweet. That's so beautiful. That's so powerful. You know, and like I said before, it doesn't look a certain way.、Yeah. You just feel it.、Yeah. You、It's、know it. It's a way of being. You know it, and you feel it. And I'm telling you right now, when you are able to have a breakthrough in this area of your life, it's transformational. I mean, you become more attractive, and and it's not just attractive to attract your mate, but you become attract more attractive to your husband, to yourself, more attractive to yourself,、yeah. more attractive to、uh, you know colleagues, more attractive to your kids. You、yeah. know, if there's this ability to,、uh, you know, the other analogy I use in my program is men are like Mack trucks.、Mm-hmm. We're big and we're dopey, and we're just barreling down the highway of life. You know, women in our culture have been taught to be Mack trucks too, but you tell me what's more powerful. Being the Mack truck, or being behind the wheel、yeah. inside that safe cabin with that little tiny steering wheel and those little pedals, what's leadership? Being the Mack truck or being behind the wheel of the Mack truck? Being behind the wheel of it. I would think so,、yeah. right? I mean, that's it. And so, like, when you、yeah. realize the power of femininity is true power, it's true breakthrough, and you can lead your life and the lives of people around you in any direction you wish. So good, so good, and I can speak from experience. Just having you in my corner to help me unleash the feminine elements of myself, and it's really transformed my life. I've transformed my career over it, to be honest. You know, so、um, just really powerful distinctions. And、uh, yeah, thank you so much for being here. Is there anything else well, that well, you yeah, want to just I, share? I think what you just said is so powerful too. Is the the breakthroughs keep coming、yeah. in wealth, in career,、yeah. in friendships? Like you start to have these distinctions, right?、Mm-hmm. Especially when you when you when you activate. You know your femininity as your natural self-expression. You activate this polarity,、yeah. like you become a magnet to what's awesome, and you become like you know when you're a kid, you have the magnets and they the, the north、repel. versus the south, they、yeah. repel. Yeah, so you become a magnet for all kinds of extraordinary things in your life.、Uh, and remember, it's your natural self-expression. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it is for you. Everyone is unique. Your feminine expression is like a fingerprint. Yeah, it truly is. It is your self-expression. But watch the magic happen in、Absolutely. career, in relationship, in motherhood, in all of these different things. I love it. Well, such amazing topic, such amazing distinctions. We are definitely going to have to have you back here.、Um, I think we need to do one about the male, like the male、yeah. distinctions as well. Of But, course, because、um, so powerful. But、um, where can people find you?、Uh, you have this amazing curriculum to help women transform and really tap into their femininity.、Um, as you're speaking about it today, where can they find you? How can they get a hold of you? Yeah, the program I design. Is called Captivate His Soul, and it's at CaptivateHim dot com. So CaptivateHim dot com, and you know, there's a、uh, a a quick seminar video on there, training for for you to go through, and there's a program that comes on the back end of that, and、uh, yeah, so CaptivateHim dot com is the best place for anyone who wants to further their breakthroughs or actually have someone you know walk them through, and because the most difficult thing, as you know,、yeah. is you know going on the journey alone,、Absolutely. right? Having a guide, having a coach, having someone lead you to give you the breakthroughs that you need. 
Absolutely. I love it. Well, we will link that in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here. I just put you on the spot because now you know you're coming back. Uh, Thanks for tuning in, ladies, and we will talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you heard and you're interested in breaking out of your own food, body, and diet prison, here's what I want you to do next. Head on over to StresslessEating.com. That's StresslessEating.com and sign up to watch the Stressless Eating webinar where I'll walk you through the exact five-step game plan my female clients use to conquer emotional eating, self-sabotage, and finally heal themselves from the restrictive all-or-nothing diet mentality for good, but without obsessing or spending years in therapy to address it. I've laid it all out for you there in five easy steps. Remember, Healing your relationship with food and your body does not happen by itself. You need expert guidance to make it happen, and we've helped clients all over the world take back their power from the food and find true and lasting freedom while enjoying life and warm chocolate chip cookies along the way. To see if we can help you do the same, head on over to StresslessEating.com. I'm Leanne Ellington, and I'll see you next time.